Welcome to Africa Answers, a series featuring young African fellows unpacking topical issues affecting Africa and proposing solutions to challenges. I am your host, Slindi Lemlilo. Today, I'll be chatting to Moses Mawa Satolino from South Sudan, who is a peace building and conflict analysis expert. Welcome, Moses. Thank you so much, and I'm exceedingly profound to be here and looking forward for the discussions with you, Slindi Awesome. So we will get right into it. You work around issues of peace building and uh, conflict, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times when we hear about Africa, a lot of people associate it with conflict and, uh, you know, regional uh, or ethnic tensions, right? What is your take on that? And where do you think we are as a continent in terms of that? I think I will slightly disagree with that narrative and Africa is moving forward in terms of containing peace. As you can see, um, the records indicate that from 2024, the level of conflict in Africa started reducing from 30 to 29 and to 9 in 2009 and to 1 in 2021. So that clearly indicates that Africa is moving, there's a trajectory set moving from insecurity to peace building. And we are seeing that so many countries are moving forward. If you look at the GDP, the uh, GDP global index is, more, is indicating high. So, let, yes, lately there has been rise in terms of coup d'etat in countries like Mali, in a country like Guinea, in country like Angola. But that does not so, rather Burkina Faso, but that does not so Africa as a continent is mired with conflict. There are tremendous effort being put forward to contain that. Yes, lately, countries like uh, Ethiopia has, has been experiencing conflict among itself with its communities, but efforts have been put. The regional uh, bodies are working forward to ensure that that conflict has, been, has to be resolved. DRC, we also saw that it's facing a lot of conflict, but the regional body is moving to resolve that. And Kenya being one of the country in the, the East African bloc is trying to mediate that. So I think that narrative, we would say yes, Africa has been experiencing conflict, but also tremendous effort has been put to contain that conflict. And we have seen how local initiatives have been amount to resolve conflict within Africa, unlike the colonial past that engulf Africa as a continent, most of its issues have been resolved by international community. Mm. So that trajectory is changing now and Africa is moving forward in terms of resolving its conflict. Yes, we are dealing that conflicts happening, but efforts are on the way to resolve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as someone from South Sudan, uh, I mean, your country is also known for experiencing conflicts, right? Um, can you take us through, you know, the situation, the current situation, and maybe also go back to what actually led to the conflict? What were the issues? And how was this resolved, or how is this being resolved on the ground? South Sudan as a country, there's been one of the countries that experienced one of the longest conflicts in Africa, 21 years of conflict within itself. And that conflict justified the need for the South to separate from the North. And that need has been fulfilled in 2020-11. So the regional blocs through the IGAD, which is known as the Intergovernmental Authority for Development mediated a peace agreement between the North and South. And in 2011, South Sudan gained state independence. 99.9 .9 people, South Sudanese, voted for secession. And that clearly tells you the amounting issues that the South were lobbying for, were yearning for, which is the peace. Peace to have a kind of autonomy for their own so that they can have their own administration, their own set of leadership, and that has been achieved, and peace is taking course in South Sudan as we speak. Mm. Yes, there has been conflict after the independence, after the cessation, there has been conflict, the 2013 conflict, which actually occurred between the political elites and the regional blocs, which is eager, came in to resolve that conflict. And the parties are now committed to resolve the, the 
the conflict through a peace accord known as the River Clyde Agreement for the Resolution of Conflicts in South Sudan. So that peace accord provided a framework for the political parties to resolve the conflict, starting from power sharing to security arrangement to constitutional review. So as of last week, the parliament has, has approved the constitutional review process to go ahead. So that's a step forward that now Africa or South Sudan being one of the youngest country in the bloc is trying to resolve its conflict within the spheres of Africa as a continent. Mm. Would you say you have achieved peace? I would say to a larger extent, yes, peace has been achieved. Of course, in Africa, there's this nature of conflict, armed conflict and intercommunal conflict. So in terms of South Sudan, coming to South Sudan, political violence has subsided, which is the biggest, you know, nature of conflict and want in, in, for a lack of better word, if I may say, that's, you know, have a wider impact on the community. But at subnational level, intercommunal conflict um, is still there, but efforts have been put in place to resolve that. And different pieces in infrastructures are working to resolve intercommunal conflict. So I would say, yes, um, efforts have been put in place to resolve conflict in South Sudan, and parties are working hard to ensure that peace is sustained at mm -hmm. all corners of South Sudan. Yeah. And so what were some of the interventions that you, was, you were experiencing locally and, and at a national level to get the country to where it is? There are a lot of interventions that's been put forward. From the African Union, we have the African Peace and Security Council that has been working with the stakeholders in South Sudan uh, to resolve this political statement, and that has been working positively. The African Union Peace and Security, I think, has been providing also oversights, you know, to the leadership to ensure that this conflict is addressed because this is one of the key pillars of the African Peace and Security as an institution to ensure that peace prevails in countries like South Sudan. Mm. At a regional level, we have the AGAT that has been from the onset mediating conflict in South Sudan, actually at the regional bloc, trying to ensure that conflict is contained, miring tensions are resolved. And at the local level, we have a lot of peace infrastructures. We have the faith-based group who are working with different actors. Actually, the River Talai Peace Agreement, one of the package was mediated by the faith-based group. So that is a testimony to tell you that even local institutions now, when empowered, they can resolve conflict at a local level. And so that's, that, that could be one of the lessons learned that need to mm -hmm. be picked up, how local institutions are also taking steps in mediating conflict, you know, at the regional level and in the context of South Sudan. Mm. But also we have very instrumental uh, peace actors like women blocks. The African Peace and Security Council has this package for Network for Africa, women mediators. So that can be replicated in countries like Africa, like South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, and even Ethiopia, because women are key actors in resolving conflict. Mm. Because they know that those men fighting in the battle fronts are their husbands, their children. And if women are given the opportunity to mediate conflict, I think there will be an enormous impact, if I may say, because mm. They have a direct impact into the life of men, if mm -hmm. I would say, because they can influence decision in one way. Mm. So this is something that needs to be really taken forward, that women need to take a center stage in resolving conflict, because if they're empowered, they can do so. Yeah. So if you look at the local level, South Sudanese women, despite the enormous suffering, they still have the ability to talk to their children in terms of you know, engaging in conflict advising their children not to engage in conflict. So some of this conflict could be politically driven. So if they talk to their children, this youth could not even involve into conflict. So women have this opportunity really to become peace actors, not only peace actors, but also to take part in peace building processes from peacemaking to peace building processes. And I think women can do that. So the other architecture that need to be also look at is the, the youth. 
because this is one of the energetic component of the population and once they're empowered positively they can also lead to sustainable development they can influence how decision is governed in in a country like south sudan so i think these peace infrastructures are very 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 important mm. but also the think tanks and opinions leaders these are very instrumental actors that need to be brought on board what is lacking is how do those institutions how can those institutions be actualized so that they take a center stage in peacemaking but also beyond that in peace building processes yeah. because they are part and parcel of the communities mm -hmm. yeah at a community level do you have examples of peace building initiatives that have been effective yes in my work i, I work with this localized peace initiative because the thing is if you work with um, this localized initiative they own the process and you, you can see the result. Yes, it is very difficult to measure peace in its sense because it's, it's difficult to quantify it. Mm. And oftentimes, its results take time. Mm. And uh, for, a local, for the local community, it's very hard for them to see the results at a certain period of time because of how difficult to quantify peace. Mm. But of course, if you, if you use local institutions like women block, youth block, religious leaders, opinion leaders, think tanks, they mm. can deliver results because then they are part of the community, they are part and parcel of the community. So whatever discussion that is table, there's a kind of honesty. You see sense of belonging, the different actors who are making decisions. Yeah. I like the fact that as a woman, I like the fact that you brought up uh, making sure that women are also recognized in terms of peace building, right, and the role that they play uh, during the conflict, right? Uh, because many a times uh, I personally feel that the, the role of women is erased in history. Like even if you look at um, how we document po colonization, the period, most of our heroes or, um, you know, or people who are so-called emancipators, the face that you see is mostly men. Of course, there are some countries that document women, but mainly it's it's usually men, right? But we know that women play or played a pivotal role, right, uh, during that that period. So when you mention emancipating or empowering, I guess empowering is the word that you used, women, right? What are examples? What would be a tangible example of empowering women who are within the space are also contributing in terms of fighting or trying to establish peace within a country. Maybe you can draw examples from your own context. I am one of the, the key supporters of women empowerment. And I believe that um, women, if given the opportunity, they can produce results, especially in peace building area. What I do see that is lacking is the institution for women to take effective role. And that has been missing a lot not only in South Sudan, but in Africa as a continent, perhaps because of one reason or the other. But if women are institutionalized, or if women are given space to come and discuss their issues, issues pertaining peace building, they can take a greater step and a greater contribution. So I work with women block in South Sudan, trying to restructure, starting from restructuring their organization, and ensuring that this organization has, you know, have these um, women in different sectors, whether women in advocacy, women in mobilization. So I work with this women block and they're making a lot of progress in terms of that. So borrowing from that experience is what is missing is that women need to be provided a space, a space that they can discuss issues, they can provide policies, they can provide an advocacy uh, platform to discuss national issues. Mm -hmm. And if that is provided, women can even do far greater than what we imagine. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do we ensure that this institution work? It requires finances. It requires a kind of an oversight, you know, a kind of an oversight um, I would say an oversight kind of decisions, not only from one entity, but different actors coming together, trying to take, you know, role in supporting women. And if that is done, then we'll see women, you know, 
mm-hmm. building on different network, having best experiences from different places mm-hmm. and see how best those experiences can be actualized in, yeah. in their context. Yeah. So that has to start taking step. Mm-hmm. They have to start taking step, not only in South Sudan, but also in other, in other countries. Mm-hmm. So if these women are exposed to different scenarios that is happening in Africa, and I think they can come up with one common solution to address some of these issues. Yeah. And this common solution will be a unifying mm-hmm. um, platform for women across yeah. Africa. Yeah, yeah. In terms of solutions, uh, Moses, you spoke up. I mean, uh, you know, you spoke at length about some of the solutions that are taking place or have taken place, right? Some of the interventions. So we're in an era of uh, digitization, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I recently attended a peace tech conference where which brought different stakeholders together who are using technology to address issues of peace. Um, Where do you see the role of technology here, right? Uh, Do you have any practical examples that you can draw from where we are actually, where technology is actually helping in terms of um, alleviating conflict, number one, and also promoting peace? I would say in the context of Africa, that has been missing Mm. and it's still missing. So this is one of the best practices that Africa as a continent need to start taking. Mm-hmm. Because then there, there are a lot of um, scenarios that requires technology, this technology to come in. For instance, if, if you really want to build on experiences of people, you want to reflect ideas in people's mind, you need to use uh, a scenario-based kind of situations. For instance, if conflict happens in, in, in Ethiopia or in Rwanda or wherever, so you can project that scenario in maybe five minutes play. The audience that you're trying to take them through, whether on conflict mitigation or on conflict management skills, let them look at the situation, let them look at the scenario. So we need to start moving out from this way of presenting, you know, f- um, you know forums where we just have a paper and we present to people and say, this is what is happening. Mm-hmm. But if you project the scenario to people, people look at it, you know, it reflects into their mind, the instincts keep into their mind. And there you can try to draw a kind of intervention strategies mm-hmm. on how to address some of this. So this has been missing. So I'm practically narrowing down to the way we conduct our session when it mm-hmm. comes to conflict management or mm-hmm. conflict prevention. Mm-hmm. So most time we use this traditional setup, you know, of organizing forum. And that does not leave a kind of image in the mind of the audience. Yes, they know that is a mere uh, workshop you organize. And so what is the information that the person carries? So role of digitalization can come in now in terms of projecting image, projecting information that people can see the reality, the pain that others have been going through and they reflect into their life and that can really create an impact. Second is in terms of information gathering. Working in the localized level, I still see that a lot is missing, which is why if you look at how do we capture information, how do we vary information, this is still lacking a lot because we have not used um, a digital instruments to, you know, to, to actualize some of our information. Most time, we collect information from either primary source or from secondary source, and it's very difficult to verify this information. So we can now advance this course to, you know, inculcating digital aspects to come in to ensure that information can be verified and we have different alternative sources to, you know, to comprehend information. So that has to start taking course in Africa as mm-hmm. a continent. Yeah. I mean, in, your, in, some, in one of your responses, you mentioned that uh, peace, if I got you correctly, is... Peace building is an ongoing thing, right? It's, it's not a once-off thing, right? And I think our topic is touching on uh, peace building after conflict, right? Yeah. So what are some of the effects, um, you, know, you know, that take place, if, it's, if I'm telling you correctly? What are some of the effects of conflict? And um, how, what are the interventions that are ongoing or that should be ongoing to ensure that you know, we maintain the peace, right? 
because I don't think it's a matter of shaking hands and signing concessions and then we leave it at there, right? I think it's, it's a continuous effort that needs to be done. So what are the things that are happening on the ground or that you feel still need to be done to ensure that we continue to maintain peace? It could be either in the context of South Sudan or maybe from examples of places elsewhere. I feel that from from the beginning, even before we talk about peace building, mm. the peacemaking processes mm. itself, is that um, if you don't have key stakeholders at play, then that's where you start going wrong. And I see that in most African countries, and you know, when it gets to peacemaking processes, the actors are not really the the, the broader network of the actors are not brought together. Either there's only a few individuals that takes the process. So when it comes to now peacemaking or peace building processes, you find that the process becomes very difficult because then from the onset, the the actors, the level of mobilization was not very comprehensive. Only a few actors that started the process. Now in the peace building, you intend to bring actors who do not have clear understanding of how the processes start. So we need to start moving out of that narrative. A conversation needs to start on mm-hmm. how do we start mobilize, mobilizing a large number of actors to be taking part in peace processes right from the onset, from the let go. We start bringing these actors, start taking center stage, taking mm-hmm. responsibility, starting understanding the contextual issues that need to be discussed. And in that, we can achieve more. So this will now bring in the these key actors that I mentioned, because mm-hmm. they have influence in the communities. Mm. So once these key actors are influenced, they are part of the processes. You find that peacemaking process becomes an easy thing. Peace building process become an easy thing because then the communities who have got you know interests, who have got influence on their own actors, will find it easier that yes, a step is being made. And secondly, they can see some of the dividend because they know their representations has always been reflected from the onset. They know that a community leaders from a particular area has been involved in the process from the beginning. So that's, you know, it creates a kind of awareness. The awareness process and advocacy at that process is being maintained because they know what is taking place, which is why I find it very difficult sometimes when people say, we need to have you know, funding for awareness. Why do we do that? Because we know that we, we have missed something out. We know that the, we have not involved key actors from the let go to the process. So if we do so, then we would have not been in the process of now saying we need to create awareness so that people know. I think that's something we start. We need to start correcting. We need to have key actors. We have a comprehensive lead. We have people all represented in the process, so mm-hmm. that people get to know the trends of the the, the particular information that needs to be known has to be known mm-hmm. at the grassroots level, mm-hmm. so that they also start taking process. They start owning it from the right mm-hmm. process, from the let go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's let's let's. Let's move on to the global community, yeah. right? What role does um, Western, for lack of a better word, mm. Western, Western countries uh, play in terms of uh, conflict resolution and peace building? I do feel that um, for a long period of time that the Western world that's taken part in resolving conflict, not only in Africa, but also in other continents. And a, a, a tremendous efforts has been done and that achievement has been reflected in so many countries. If you go to Europe, maybe because of the recent conflict in Ukraine, but Europe has been peaceful for a larger extent. If you go to you, Asia, most of the parts have been peaceful, America. So, so I think now that narrative need to start changing, that there's need to start giving ownership to the people at the ground, because then that's, you know, create legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Second, uh, it leaves a kind of, um, uh, it sustain the process itself. People own the process. So what do I mean here? That there, in every community, there's a structure. 
if a structure is not there, it can be created. The key people who are very influential because people don't know that conflict starts from the grassroots level, which is why we need to really focus more on addressing localized conflict because then that conflict can fly up to a national level conflict. It can go to regional, it can go to continental and worldwide. So the more we start enhancing the capacity of local institutions, the better we start addressing conflict and the easier you know we start creating a safe and peaceful environment for people mm -hmm. so local institutions need to be built they need to be empowered this institution from the religious from the faith-based group to think tanks to civil society women youth all these institutions need to be enhanced their capacity need to be enhanced if it requires financial uh, funding they have to be given if sure, so that they know the capacity, they know the people, they know the contextual issues at, at the ground. So the role of international community can come in terms of, you know, providing financial support. But beyond that also, they can provide an oversight role, trying to see how things are moving, trying to create platform for, you know, for, for sharing best practices in issues that happen either in Europe or in Asia, they can, create that scenario, they can provide oversight in terms of that. They can provide funding for these institutions to start really running this mm -hmm. initiative at a grassroots level. So the key message here is how do international community, you know, focus more in, you know, building the capacity of local institutions so that they take center stage in promoting peace awareness, mm -hmm. you know, in promoting peace building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of, um a gain on responses, right, mm -hmm. at the international uh, community. What is your take? Because there's, there's been these, I don't know if it's debates or criticism, right, mm -hmm. leveled against the international community in terms of how they've dealt with Ukraine, uh, Ukraine-Russia war, right, mm -hmm. versus how they've dealt with other conflicts in other spaces, especially with, with interventions, right? We, we see not to compare lives and not to compare uh problems or situations but we've seen that there's been more reception towards assisting um victims uh from ukraine right compared to maybe if we take the syrian crisis in 2015 which was labeled as a migration crisis right we currently have the situation in in ethiopia uh with the in the tigray area right if i'm pronouncing it correctly so what what what, what is your take in terms of that do you think that um yeah what is your take yes i my take is that um the ukrainian war has really made a lot of headlines for the fact that it has provided space for media i like in other continents where uh, media fraternity finds it very difficult to you know to cover conflict with ukraine we have seen how media has played its role, you know, and that has amplified the situation. It has led people to understand the issues, the kind of suffering the Ukrainians are going through, which is very con contrary to other continents. So, and if you also look at the, the underlying causes of the conflict, the Ukrainian conflict, you know, a sovereign state, a state in thinking on the legitimacy of the other, it calls for a just kind of reasoning from, you know, world powers, from peace actors at the international level. Whereas in Africa or in other continents, if you look at the nature of the conflict, it's more or less of power struggle, you see. So the distinction between the two narratives, it has created a kind of balance in terms of what kind of response so people or international communities start projecting at looking at uh, a sovereign stage, a state infringing on the sovereign legitimacy of the mm -hmm. other. Whereas in another continent, people are fighting in there because of resource sharing, because of power. So that has created a kind of you know narrative, different narrative in the minds of of, of, of international communities. So, despite that, 
the underlying reasoning should be the way I look at it is that all life matters, whether Ukrainian, whether Ethiopian, whether uh, Congolese, all life matters. And these issues can also be, a, be addressed at different platforms. We have the G7, we have the G20, we have the Security Council, that these issues can be addressed and resolved at that. Mm -hmm. So the overall understanding should be that much as the Ukrainian conflict has made a lot of headline um, because of the space it has provided for the media mm. to cover, you know, the extent of the conflict. Mm. Uh, in one way also should be viewed that the conflict which is happening in Ethiopia uh, as well as in DRC Congo, the people dying are civilians, just like the Ukrainians. So all lives should be considered and that any kind of intervention, regardless of the situation and analysis of the conflict, that response should be equal. It should be on equal footing in one way or the other. Because then we are losing life and at the end we start saying we have this number of people on the continent or globally this is the number mm -hmm. of people. We sometimes misunderstanding mm -hmm. because then the people dying are contributing to this uh, demographic if I would say the demographic um, number that the world amounts to. So I think we, we should rather say that um, all life matters and whatever intervention that need to be provided should be provided in equal mm -hmm. uh, setting, regardless of the, the narrative, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of transnational governance, right, yeah. um, what do you think institutions such as the AU, you also mentioned IGAD at some point yeah. uh, in terms of uh, brokering peace or, you know, as facilitating the, the signing, right, mm -hmm. uh, between, I think, the, I don't know how you termed it, but, you know, when mm -hmm. both South Sudan and Sudan were, you know, making a peace agreement, right? Brokering. Brokering, yes. They, they uh, IGAD helped facilitate that, right? Yes. So in terms of such institutions like IGAD, the AU, where, where, what role do they play? If, you know, where are we? Are we seeing any efforts there uh, in, in in facilitating peace initiatives uh, in different uh, spaces, in different contexts in Africa? I, I think so. Yes, it, it comes to IGAD. You know, IGAD has been a key actor in the South Sudan peace process right from two thousand and. And five, the comprehensive peace agreement signed between the North and South. Mm -hmm. It was um, mediated by IGAD. Mm -hmm. and, and the 2013 conflict was medi mediated also by IGAD, which is currently actually being implemented mm -hmm. by the, the parties. So IGAD being a regional bloc, of course, does not work in isolation. It works with the AU. There are a lot of complementarities that both have. Mm -hmm. So Given that in mind, and I would like to to say that in the context of South Sudan, IGAD has done a lot. It has done a tremendous job in terms of sustaining peace, brokering peace agreement, and ensuring that uh, there's a safe environment for South Sudanese. So, and that is not being done in isolation. Of course, the AU being the the of our institutions for Africa as a continent provides a lot of oversight role. The African Peace and Security Council is one of the instrument that you know support also peace initiative, which is why I'm also saying that um, some of these local institutions in South Sudan could also be enhanced through the the network for women, the network for African women mediators. They can play a role in supporting those. Um, peace infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And so EGAT plays a very mm -hmm. important role in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we see also that most of these, uh, there are also regional blocks, not only in East Africa, mm -hmm. but also in West Africa. We have the ECOWAS, mm -hmm. you know, doing tremendous job despite the increasing coup d'etat, you mm -hmm. know, in Western Africa and in Sub Saharan countries. ECOWAS is doing more to that. We have seen sustained um, sanctions been leveled on the, on the press and the, and the political leaders who, you know, um, who 
took power at their hands forcefully. So I think all regional institutions are working hard to sustain peace. And for IGAD as institutions, they have really done a lot in the context of South Sudan. Mm. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, so in terms of going back to your country and the international community as well, how can the international community play a role in supporting the South Sudan peace infrastructure, right? In light of the current uh, revitalized agreement um, on the resolution of South Sudan um, conflict? Now there's this ongoing peace agreement which has been implemented, known as ARCAS, the Revitalized Agreement for the Resolution of Conflict in South Sudan. So that agreement has been, it's been implemented for the last two years. And so there are a lot of things that the regional community, the international community can come in to support that peace process. Mm -hmm. The power sharing has been done and the parties are working towards the security arrangement, which is more or less uh, look at the unification of the forces. And that is ongoing and forces are being unified. The constitutional review has been finalized and passed by the parliament. Mm. So beyond that, you know, I, I feel there are other package of the constitution of the peace agreement that the international community can support also, mm. especially the issues of truth and, and reconciliations. So that part they can come in supporting even the, the the security arrangement. We understand that the EU through the peace um, uh, the EU through the peace fragility has a funding of about two point three point two billions given through the African Peace and Security Council, and that is to support you know stabilize insecurity in Africa. And so if such kind of funding can also be extended, you know, to support an ongoing peace initiative, which parties are really making efforts, you know, to implement and ensure that peace prevail, I think that's called for a just kind mm -hmm. of um, uh, grievance is that there's need to invest in some of this, uh, uh, some of this peace initiative so that it is more sustained and that its dividends, you know, is realized and that it supports grassroots communities and address different layers of conflict. Mm -hmm. So that does my take. Yeah. And I think from a policy level, are there any policies that are being in place to ensure peace um, to ensure peace building and also especially to prevent conflict, whether at a continental level, regional level or at a national level? Are there any policies or legislations that have been um, developed and are being implemented currently? For now, the, the peace agreement um, um, becomes a, the key actual instrument that needs to be implemented. And if that is done successfully, then it uh, positions the country to election. Of course, the, the, there's need, for, of course, to have a lot of policies, you know, from different think tanks and also from other uh, institutions. This is also, you know, to, to govern the actors, to tell the actors, give a narrative of what is happening and what one will doing things differently because policy provides recommendations on the issues mm -hmm. that different issues that are happening and it calls for a kind of policy recommendations whether in terms of intercommunal conflict which is not really a national kind of mm -hmm. or political mm -hmm. conflict and mm -hmm. that's called for uh, policy recommendations how was it done, for instance, in Mali? How was it mm. done in Somalia? How was mm. it done in Nigeria? So those kind of policy recommendations can help address um, some of this underlying conflict mm. escalating at a grassroots level. Mm. So yes, there's need to have that more. There's need to have a space for civil society and think tanks to be able to provide um, recommendations to the, the government in terms of addressing mm. conflict. Yeah. at the localized level yeah. but the peace agreement um contains some of these aspects yeah yeah and at a leadership level what should african governance government governments mm. <laughs> be doing yes at the leadership level at the leadership level i think the african union uh, has been engaging with the south sudanese counterpart tirelessly and egads also uh, to ensure that the peace agreement is implemented. And so there's need to have that sustained engagement with the parties to the agreement. 
that sustained engagement uh, can take a, a, a notion of seeing what are the existing gap, how can the existing gap be addressed? For instance, if, if it comes to the, the issues of um, um, transitional justice, mm. how can it be addressed? Okay, mm. so if it comes to issues of security arrangement, what kind of funding is required to support, you know, to, f to support the security arrangement? Mm. Because there's a lot that needs to be done to, you know, with, with the army itself, restructuring, putting in place, putting funding to ensure that, you know, there are resources for the, you know, for the military. So that's, the regional bloc and AU can, you know, have a kind of engagement mm. with with the actors so that this is really um, addressed. Yeah. 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 And in closing, uh, you've been here for three months and uh, you've been learning so much here from the EUI and uh, engaging with different academics, professionals, practitioners, policy makers, right? Um, what are the key things that you've learned that you want to go back home and implement if need be or things that have provoked you in terms of like expanding your mind on certain issues that maybe you were not aware of or you're not paying attention to so i guess basically in general what are your key takeaways from your experience here well um being here is, is a, it's a unique exposure to me um i also got to learn you know the academic side of what I do practically. So connecting the nexus, you know, between academic and, and you know, the on-ground practice, yes. mm -hmm. practice is one of the ever-reaching, I would say, the aspirations that have been yearning. And so I got this in EUI and it's very unique. Also working at the, the grassroots level, mainly that the, Technical aspect gives you know gives me the position to understand how policies could be implemented. Mm -hmm. You know, especially what is being um, recommended recommended at the strategic at the technical level, and how can you transcend that? You know, at the strategic level. So I got to also to learn that because you work with different actors, and so you need to have a clear understanding of how policies are implemented and interpreted by different actors, not mm -hmm. only learned, you know, per se communities, but also communities who are unlearned. Mm -hmm. How do you interpret some of these policies? Mm -hmm. And this also I got to have a better understanding at EUI. And above all also is the, you know, the network, you know, meeting with highly level professionals and lecturers is one of the, I would say it's one of the unique uh, experience that I've, I've really had here in the last three months. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Moses. This has been great. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Uh, I personally learned a lot. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. And mm -hmm. I look forward to more of the work that you're going to be doing in shaping the world to become a better place. Thank you so much. And... Um, it's nice to be here and having this interview. I hope it will weigh some impact on the leadership.